My name is Katie McWilliams. I am a senior at Missouri State University studying creative writing, and I will be reading A Unique Vessel, Creating New Modes of Communication, Stanley Kunitz's The Well-Fleet Whale, and the Biblical Accounts of Jesus Christ. Although poet Stanley Kunitz is often categorized with the new criticism movement of the 1940s and 50s, which emphasizes formal structures in literature, the Wellfleet Whale is one of his later poems that demonstrates his efforts to create his own vessel so he would not be, as William Blake famously stated, quote, enslaved by another man's system, end quote. Although the poem has a lot to offer in terms of analyzing each stanza's unique structure and the overall musicality within the lines, this paper will focus on how the poem establishes Kunitz's own vessel through its subject matter. The Wellfleet Whale attests to Kunitz's careful study of the Bible early on in his career, which is also influenced by his Jewish background, because it shares many thematic similarities with the prose that tells the story of Jesus Christ, the central figure of the New Testament in the Christian Bible, who entered the world to suffer for the sins of humanity. By analyzing how Kunitz uses a narrative storytelling template from Greek tragedy, the whale in The Well-Fleet Whale can be interpreted as a representation of Christ because both of these characters lose their immortalized qualities, which helps mortals develop deeper connections with them. In The Well-Fleet Whale, Kunitz recreates his experience of encountering the aftermath of a tragic beaching and whaling at the shores of Cape Cod. The poet creates contemplative pauses in the story by numbering each of his five distinct sections. In the first section, Kunitz emphasizes sound and carefully selected diction to depict the whale as a creature of power and mystery. The second and third poems use vivid imagery to depict the whale's grace and power, which are two qualities that the unnamed onlookers marvel at as the creature swims in the Atlantic Ocean from afar. The fourth section elaborates on the bond that the onlookers have created between themselves and the whale as tourists enter the scene to watch the creature slowly die on the shores of Cape Cod. The majestic nature of the whale fades in the fifth and final section as it elaborates on the creature's fleeting nature. In addition to Kunitz's uses of distinct diction and imagery, the poet stated in an interview with Donald G. Parker and John I. Siegel that the poem's, quote, narrative structure lent itself directly to the tenets of Greek tragedy the whole architecture of Greek tragic poets and dramatists, Sophocles in particular, end quote. Both the biblical accounts of Christ's earthly ministry and Kunitz's The Wellfleet Whale parallel in the ways that they apply this narrative structure as well as explore the bond between the central figures and the mortal characters. The whale and Christ begin to establish their roles as communicators in their respective prologues, which are part one of The Wellfleet Whale and chapter one of The Gospel of John. In his analysis on the structures of a Greek play, Professor Bruce McLennan states that a Greek tragedy's prologue is the, quote, monologue or dialogue preceding the entry of the chorus, which presents the tragedy's topic, end quote. Part one of The Wellfleet Whale reads like a dialogue. For example, the poem's opening statement creates a conversational tone. Quote, you have your language too, an eerie medley of clicks and hoots and trills, end quote. Similarly, chapter one of the Gospel of John is the prologue of Christ's ministry. Its third person narration acts as his introduction, and he begins to establish a relationship with mankind through communication. As verse four of chapter one states, quote, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, end quote. Kunitz's whale initially connected with mankind through a more physical method, audible sounds made by language. John's gospel account uses broader physical concepts to emphasize the spiritual connection that Christ strived to make with mankind. For example, life is referenced in the scripture because it would offer salvation or light from the darkness of mankind's sins. The power of communication between living beings is explored through different mediums in part two of the wealthy whale, as well as chapter two in the Gospel of Luke. They are similar to entrance odes in Greek tragedy, which McLennan describes as, quote, entry chants of the chorus, end quote. In the wealthy whale, the speaker and his companions are introduced in the line, quote, 
we cheered at the sign of your greatness, end quote. In the context of Greek tragedy, they represent the chorus because, as M.H. Abrams and Geoffrey Galt Harpham state in a glossary of literary terms, they are the, quote, commentators on the dramatic actions and events, end quote. As Christ made his advent to the mortal world, the Gospel of Luke describes how the angels acted as the chorus while they celebrated the, quote, sign of his greatness, end quote. Which is a line that is used in Kunitz's poem, with the song of praise that he depicts in the gospel account itself. Quote, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. End quote. In many ways, Christ's presence on earth was just as powerful as the whales in Kunitz's The Wellfleet Whale, because he would one day blossom into a man who would declare the saving gospel message to the world. As the narratives of the whale and Christ progress, their methods of nonverbal communication create a humbling and revering effect on their witnesses. Part three of The Wellfleet Whale is like the first episode of a Greek tragedy, which McLennan says is, quote, at least in part sung or chanted, end quote, while, quote, one of the two actors interacts with the chorus, end quote. The speaker and his companions, or the chorus, interact with the whale, or the lead actor, through their observations of his graceful yet commanding movements. Quote, you seem like something forged, not driven. You seem to marry grace with power. And when you bounded into air, slapping your flukes, we thrilled to look upon pure energy incarnate as nobility of form, end quote. Although there is great distance between the whale and the mortal onlookers, both in physical power and proximity, in this section of the Wellfleet Whale, these individuals are able to connect with the creature by comparing him with tangible things, such as flukes, as well as mortal entities that are familiar to them, such as nobility. In the Gospel accounts, Christ created a similar sense of awe and wonder within his followers and non-followers alike as he performed miracles from healing the sick to resurrecting the dead. The Gospel of Matthew features one of these examples as Christ and his disciples traveled in a boat during a storm. Then his, quote, then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds of the sea obey him? End quote. Similar to how Kunitz's onlookers use tangible characteristics and understandable entities to make some sense of the whale's grandiose nature, the disciples are further able to marvel at and appreciate Christ's dominion over physical creation by witnessing one of his miracles being performed at sea. After Christ and the whale evoke what the speakers and the well-fleet whale describe as, quote, awe and wonder, end quote, within their witnesses, both of them open up doors of communication with mankind as they suffer in the mortal world. It is notable to mention that the first line, of, excuse me, the final line of the last stanza in part three of the Wellfleet Whale, which reads, quote, At dawn we found you stranded on the rocks, end quote, is similar to a complete sentence that a reader might find in a prose novel. This aspect contrasts from how the rest of the poem is structured like William Carlos's Williams' step-bound triadic line, which is characterized by stair-like indentation that helps each fragmented line transition smoothly into the next one. The finality and lack of pauses that characterizes the last line of part three further depicts the whale's Christ-like experience of departing his natural abode, which is represented by the ocean, as he entered the realm of mortality, which is represented by the rocks. The image of the whale's departure from his oceanic realm into the rough, rocky world of mankind transitions into the grotesque imagery depicted throughout part four of The Wealth of Whale, or the second episode within this tragedy. One example of this imagery is that the whale, quote, laboriously opened a bloodshot, glistening eye, end quote. It can be interpreted that by looking into the whale's eye, the speakers find a shared point of commonality. If the whale can find the strength to operate one of the smallest organs of his body, then perhaps mankind can also show resistance through the trials of temporal existence. <laughs>
The brutal details of Christ's crucifixion are relatively minimal throughout all four gospel accounts. However, during this event, he expands his communication with mankind in a more spiritual sense. After Christ breathed his last breath on the cross, the Gospel of Matthew states that, quote, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split, end quote. These images symbolize how Christ's gospel message has ended the governing authority of the law of Moses. The temple had once been the place where the high priest would annually communicate with God on behalf of the sins committed by the entire nation of Israel. Instead of physical barriers like these separating God and mankind, Christ's act of dying on the cross for all of mankind's sins opened the opportunity for them to create a complete and restored relationship with their Heavenly Father. The, quote, terror and recognition, end quote, a line for the well-fluked whale that demonstrates how the witnesses feel from seeing the suffering of the powerful beings in their narratives, can be interpreted as stationary songs. These are known as stasimens in Greek tragedy, in which the, quote, chorus may comment on or react to the preceding episode, end quote. In part five of The well Fleet Whale, speakers describe the whale as the, quote, chief of the pelagic world, end quote, to recognize that although most of his physical power is gone, he is still worthy of respect. Similarly, the opening chapter of the Gospel of John states, quote, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made, end quote. This verse communicates how Christ will always be the spiritual chief over mankind and the rest of creation despite his physical suffering. Furthermore, in the lines, quote, you brought with you the myth of another country dimly remembered, end quote, the speakers in the Wellfleet Whale acknowledge how the whale represents generations of powerful creatures that lived long before they did. Christ's power is also confirmed by his fulfillment of each prophecy that was written in biblical books like Isaiah and Psalms. Verse 5 of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is one of the most well-known passages of scripture depicting Christ's crucifixion. And one of the verses states, quote, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. End quote. Similar to how the whale seemed unknown and mysterious until mortals were able to see him in the flesh, the prophecies of Christ, which were often unclear to those who read them centuries before they took place, were confirmed through the gospel accounts. Similar to how choruses often communicate a moral lesson during the exode or exit ode, the well-fleet whale delivers a final religiously inspired message that has some resemblance to Kunitz's previous poem, Open the gates, which contains the powerful lines, quote, I stand on the terrible threshold and I see the end and the beginning, end quote. In the Wellfleet Whale, the last five lines of part five are separated from the main stanza, which represents the end of the whale's separation from humanity and the beginning of a new bond with them. Quote, Master of the whale roads, with the white wings of the gulls spread out their cover. You have become like us, disgraced and mortal, end quote. The gulls create a type of blanket over the whales. They fly above him, communicating how his majestic reign has ended and he has now taken on simpler, more futile qualities. Christ's gospel message also acts like a blanket that is white as snow, which is a simile used throughout Christian literature to describe the remission of sins. Before Christ ascends to heaven after his resurrection, his apostles are called to spread his message throughout the earth after he commands them to, quote, go and preach the gospel to every creature, end quote. Similar to the effect that the whale's mortal-like state had on its onlookers, Christ experiencing death as a man helps those who choose to hear his gospel message more fully grasp the magnitude of his sacrifice. Although the parallels between the biblical accounts of Christ and Kunitz's The Wealthly Whale may not be noticeable at first, the sacred Christian text's themes are strikingly similar to the ones Kunitz used to make his real-life experience into a universal and relatable narrative. Kunitz's course like speakers not only commentate on the main actor's qualities and actions, but they also strive to communicate with the creature who, like Christ, possesses more humane and understandable qualities than they initially anticipated. As the Bible continues to have both subtle and significant influences on the world of literature, 
It will be exciting to see how this prolific text finds its way into the vessels of future American 